Do you have a favorite? Not meant to. But mostly the unloved ones, the unvisited ones, the cases that get dusty and ignored. All the broken and shunned creatures. Someone's got to care for them. Who shall it be if not us? Yes. Welcome to Rune Soup, a weekly podcast about magic, culture, and the very best new and old ideas for living in this world. Coming to you from 43 degrees south on a small farm in deepest Tasmania. My name is Gordon, and I shall be your host. This week, we welcome to the show filmmaker Lance Mangia. Lance is the director of the recently released feature documentary Third Eye Spies. He joins us today to talk about that very project, obviously, and remote viewing in general, as well as the many cosmic implications of its efficacy. Enjoy. Lance, welcome aboard. Oh, man. Thanks for having me, Gordon. This is great. I appreciate the interview. Oh, look. I mean, congratulations on the film. Um, I I think it's fantastic. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. It's only been out like a few days and and we're already, uh, you know, top uh, 10 list on on the, uh, uh, you know, iTunes charts. Um, So, you know, you can see it pretty much anywhere it's it's available across all platforms um you know digitally um across the world or you can go to thirdeyespies.com and there's even dvds you can order there now so it's 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 really actually i'm kind of stunned and humbled at the at the response of the film you know to the film so far well that's great and uh, we were sort of chatting about this before i hit the record button i have to thank you for making the film about one of my all-time heroes ah russell targ absolutely absolutely <laughs> yeah, mine too yeah mine too actually <laughs> cool well we um i mean i'm gonna have plenty of questions uh, about that as we move further through the show but we have a traditional first question lance which is were you a weird kid um probably you know probably like uh you know i was i was always uh i think somebody that that um you know, I used to go and lay out in the backyard and just look up at the stars, imagine, you know, what was out there. And it seemed really silly to me to think that, you know, like that there's nothing else out there but us. You know, that was a question that always sort of I wondered about. And, um, you know, and then I would tend to have like a, a dream about like little small things. And then the next day you wake up and, uh, you know, you dream about a butterfly and you wake up and there's a butterfly outside the window or something, you know, little things like that, but that you kind of just kind of chalk up to. Uh, you know, just your imagination, or oh, it's 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 just nothing, and and then I stumbled across, you know, Russell Targ, and I stumbled across actually when I was a kid, a um a, a little, an old Reader's Digest article, uh, that, you know, my grandmother had a prescription, a, a, a you know, um, a subscription to, and it was about army remote viewers, and you know, basically the fact that the U.S. Army had been using psychics to spy. And I thought that was such a cool idea because, you know, the other thing I was always really interested in was, was movies, you know, and, and how I, I really wanted to make one and I would like write little scripts and kind of act them out and did a ton of plays and things like that. And, and so I kept that Reader's Digest article for years, you know, when I was a kid because it was, uh, you know, something I thought would make a cool film. And many, many, many years later, I just very randomly, uh, you know, met Russell Targ and, and that led us to, to make the documentary that you, we are talking about today. So, um, well, it's one of the questions was how that happened. But before we get to it, does that mean that the kind of interest in uh, topics like this predates film? Uh, it's because I get a lot of artists who are involved in, you know, psi or magic or the paranormal on the show, and uh, and it's very difficult for it seems talking to these people for a, a creative to separate them. To kind of go, I'm not sure which one came first because it is about inquiry into the world. I mean, is that your experience, or did you like the weird well, and then think you want to make films about it? Um, no, it was it was really kind of hard to separate because uh, I always would write things about weird things. You know, I would always, you know, um, I loved fantasy, I loved sci-fi, I loved you know all of those things. And I think it was really when I became an adult and I got into the film industry after leaving film school that uh, people try to 
pigeonhole you as an artist. They try to, you know, make you something that they can market and sell. And uh, it wasn't something paranormal. It was, I was actually operating more in sort of the action and, you know, sort of music video type, you, you know, industry at the time when I first started many years ago. And um, so you feel like, oh, I have to be like that. And, and, and actually, it was only when I sort of developed a lot more control over uh, the material that I was doing that I sort of said, you know, no, I want to, I want to tell stories about things that I like. And this happened to be one of the things that I really like. And, and I think that actually, uh, you know, I'm finding more success in doing that, which is, I think always the case, right? Oh, you know, that, it, that does appear to be how the universe works for yeah. sure. Uh, so yeah. when you say you want to make films about things that you had an interest in, did you kind of stay up to date in the, uh, sort of, 20 year unveiling of different bits of kind of the Stargate program and, and, and say, or was it you always had in the back of your head, your grandmother's reader's digest article, and you'd hopefully one day come back to it. Did you, have you read, you know, prior to meeting him and you read Russell's books and, and Jim Mars's patchy book and, and that kind of stuff? Um, I, I had, uh, well, when I was a kid, there was no such thing as the internet. There was no such thing as computers even until I was in grade school. I think I sat um, in the first class that had the Apple IIe, you know, when I was in probably, I don't know, uh, third, fourth grade or something like that. So so it was not as easy to immerse yourself in a, in a subject. You know, I lived in a little small farm town in Central California and, uh, you know, grew up in a family of farmers. So I was about as far away from anything sort of weird or, or maybe closer to it, I don't know. But but um, I was not immersed in the subject matter because I had no bookstores that I could go read a book about something. I had no other people around me that were interested in sort of the paranormal or, uh, you know, some of the stuff that I kind of was interested in. And so for a long time, I, I just sort of thought it was my own kind of little hobby that I, I liked and I would just channel that into short stories and plays and things like that. But I wasn't really... Uh, you know, didn't know anybody else was, was interested in something or not, you know. Um, and then many, many years later, um, when I sort of decided that I needed to sort of find out more about who I was as a, as a person, um, I kind of, you know, I took up meditation and I, I started reading a lot of books. I had some spare time and I uh, would read many, many books about the paranormal and, uh, you know, things like that. And and um, And that's when I really decided that I would make that a part of my creative life for real, you know, as, as sort of a priority. And, and, um, it took me a long time to do that, you know, to, to, to really come to that, but, um, you know, probably 20, 2009, 10, 11, you know, the, in that, that period, I really sort of just started doing that. I started blogging on, on my uh, website, um, on wakinguniverse.com. You can still see some of those blogs there, uh, which also now is a metaphysical shop, actually, like my wife, um, runs a metaphysical shop called Waking Universe on one side of our business and I run a, a studio, you know, for film on the other side. So, you know, we're we're very self-contained so we can be close to our daughters, like how we do it here. Um, from then, um, you know, I started doing a, a, a television show for, uh, you know, really just kind of an online TV show that was also on public access uh, called Waking Universe where I would interview sort of people who are interested in uh, weird things, I guess you could say, but, um, but always trying to be grounded, you know, from a very sort of a grounded perspective, because it was part of my own education in terms of how I sort of viewed the world, you know, like, what did I think about the world? So I would bring, you know, people on, everybody always wants to be on a TV show. So they would, I would get some really great guests. I had like Paul Selig on, who's a very well-known writer now, um, did the I Am The Word series, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bashar, you know, Daryl Anka, who channels Bashar was on my show and several other people. And, and, um, and then one day I just got a random phone call from, you know, Russell Targ. And by then I was very well versed in sort of the whole consciousness studies uh you know kind of thing you know like where i had, I had read stuff by like dean Radin and by uh you know russell himself and um you know other people and so he actually called me because he had seen my first film which is um six string samurai which you can still find if you look for it um and it's completely not anything esoteric or having really to do with consciousness but it was very cinematic and so he had liked that and he wanted to uh, actually make a film, you know, that had nothing to do with his work at SRI or, or working with psychics for the government. Uh, it was actually just a Native American boy who developed psychic abilities and, and um, he wanted notes on it and for me to direct it, you know, and I 
read it and I gave him notes and I said, you know, I think that's cool. But the real story here is the 20 years that you spent, you, you know, um, at SRI, um, it was actually 10, but there was a 20 year program, uh, you know, spying with psychics for the government. I think that's fascinating. You know, and he said, oh, I, yeah, yeah, I guess we could talk about that. You know, like, and, and, and it just sort of grew out of that first conversation. Yeah, that's fascinating. Uh, I mean, yeah, because in, in the film, Russell says, um, sort of says you came to be at his doorstep with a box of material, and and I wouldn't mm-hmm. hear what the um what the back backstory to that I guess was, which is this. And did you find when when you had that initial discussion, which is Russell actually, this is the story. Uh, was that a similar realization amongst other people that you speak to in the film? Because you got some people who haven't really spoken before, like Ken Cress, for instance. So was that was there a sense that for the people involved in this long-running collection of projects rather than one, that um, it, it was time or were they excited or surprised? Well, um, first off, like, you know, when, when Russell showed up at my door, you know, he literally did show, he said, basically, we had one phone call for, a conversation for about three hours. And, and then he said, like, you know, well, you know, I, I'll, I'll, um, you know, I'll come out to LA and he, he lives in San Francisco. And he said, I'll, I'll come out to LA and, and let's talk about this further. And, and, you know, a few weeks later, he he did come out to my house and he stayed for three days at a hotel nearby and and um, showed up with just this big case full of all of these documents and pictures of remote viewings and all of this weird stuff. And and um, by then, I was I was very well versed. I thought you know in terms of what uh, psychic abilities were, what the, I'd had pl- plenty of my own you know personal experiences to know that there's really something there. You know, since since I was a child, but even then as he was sort of unpacking all of this for me uh, and and telling me a lot of the amazing things that they did i started to think like man you know could this all really be real you know like what you know and and i i started to cuz i still sort of try to always be a little bit skeptical about stuff and and i think discernment is so key because you know these days there's so much information flying around everywhere that it's very easy to just get lost in a cloud of of junk, you know, and, and, and you have to kind of keep your wits about you and understand what's real and what's not. So I, I thought to myself, you know, if I'm going to make this, this film, it has to be really solid. And, and, and I would go to bed at night and, and just wondering like, you know, how am I going to document all this and, and how do I prove all of this actually happened? And about the third day of our conversations, he gets to stuff like congressional hearings. He gets to, uh, you know, the fact that presidential cabinets were briefed and um, they had fans throughout the military. And and a lot of this was um, all recently declassified and was now available through Freedom of Information Act. And and uh, when I heard about the congressional hearings and those things, like that's when it really hit me how big this project was you know we were not talking about two little scientists in a lab somewhere with beakers and kind of just doing their things in isolation which which really has always been the case when it comes to parapsychology we're really talking about an industry uh that that grew up around sri and for the government and and uh you know very very important people being fully briefed and actually actively using this stuff and and so I thought then my next question was, who will actually come on camera and do this? And, and really my prerequisite for, for devoting a serious amount of time to making this film over the years was, all right, if, if we can convince at least a majority of the, the players that were involved originally to come forward – and and actually be in the documentary, um, then I think it'll work because we're not just relying upon the word of Russell Targ or the word of Lance Mungia. We're we're relying upon the collective weight of the history and the eyewitness testimony. It's you know, I often liken it to show a foundation and what they did for the for the Holocaust survivors. Not that this has anything to do with that, but that when it comes to something so unbelievable in polite conversation. You know, the only way that you can really get a handle on it is through the sheer weight of firsthand testimony. And and so that's the way we looked at it. And actually, that's the pitch that I gave the people who were in the film. And they all went kind of like one. Well, some were more eager to talk than others. But the begrudging ones were like, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, we need to put it on film. OK, we'll do it. You know, <laughs> you know, because no matter what, I think the people who were involved um it touched all of them like the work touched all of them even the ones who initially were very skeptical and ken cress for example uh, who you mentioned was the cia undercover 
physicist who was in charge of the remote viewing program at its inception. Uh, you know, and um, he was not a, a psychic guy. He was not esoteric in any way. He did not know or care about any of this stuff. Um, he just was looking at data, and he saw that the data he was getting had unexplainable, uh, you know, connections in it, um, and started to find that useful. And um, and then really wanted to get to the bottom of it as a scientist because he was a scientist himself, and and he felt that it needed to be taken seriously, you know, for that reason, and also because it was you know fairly useful, and uh, and he said himself, you know, the CIA was the worst place to do science and actually you know prove something because the CIA didn't really care about that; they just wanted it to work, and it and it did, and um, so you know we attracted a, a huge sort of score with a lot of the people that were you know in the film you know we had edgar mitchell it was actually edgar mitchell's last you know interview i think the last real interview he did before he passed away and he was the uh you know sixth man to walk on the moon you know um and he was instrumental to the beginning of the program and we had you know hal put off oops sorry um we had um we had Hal Putoff, who was also the co-founder of the SRI program. We got, you know, Kit Green, who was the uh, director of life sciences for CIA, and he was the CIA uh, program monitor for a large part of the program. And um, yeah, I was surprised to see. I mean, because th- these projects are a few decades old now. It was really I, I I didn't look Kit Green up on LinkedIn, right? I was surprised to see he's still mm-hmm. working. I think that's really impressive. That I hadn't heard him or read him speak at length uh, about this project. It's a, I think it's a testament to your um, filmmaking skills to get people like Ken Cress and, and, and Kit Green to give what I interpreted or experienced as uh, their genuine recollections of, of what went on. Well, um, Ken Cress, for example, um, asked me for questions ahead of time, and, and then he added even questions that he kind of wanted to be asked. Uh, and then he submitted all of that to CIA for vetting. You know, he mm. actually had to get approval from CIA in order to reveal stuff. And and uh, I, I don't know if Kit did that, but but I know that um, with Kit, it took months of back and forth and background interviews and, uh, you know, him telling me the stories and like listening to my responses and sort of gauging me, you know, um, before he would finally consent to the interview. And in fact, even... On the way to the airport, he called me and said, "I I just don't know if we should do this or not." And uh, you know, no, you know, and, and we went back and forth, and and finally, you know, I, I convinced him, and we moved forward. But um, yeah, and and you know, with with people like Kid, especially, you know, who who I think has has been a career s- person who's dealt with intelligence issues. Um, Anytime you talk to someone like that, it's like peeling away layers of an onion, mm. and and you and you never quite know where you stand or you know what the real truth is, and and because they're CIA, I mean they, they these guys are are you know basically masters of this game of like of like information and misinformation and these kinds of things, and so again, that's why I needed the other 30, you know, or so people who have like PhDs and lifelong reputations for being very credible to, to, to be in the film, because we didn't want this to just be another, uh, sort of esoteric story that, that, uh, sounds interesting, but, you know, could just be a ghost story. You know, this, this was, these were real scientists who doing very credible work. Um, and, and I wanted that so that we're not just preaching to the choir. You know, where th- this is a film that you can show your mom, or or your uh, you know your girlfriend or or whoever uh, that doesn't know anything about this stuff, and they'll go, you, you know, wow, I mean, there's maybe something to this. I actually had a long argument with my friend who is a hardcore, uh, you know, atheist, doesn't believe in anything, completely logical mind, a brilliant you know filmmaker friend of mine, and um and he was just went on and on. He said, you know, when he found out that Uri Geller was in the film, he said, oh, how could you put Uri Geller in the movie? He's, he's been debunked and he's, you know, and all of these people are just, they're not credible and you're going to ruin your reputation doing this movie. What are you doing? And, and I said, just wait and watch the movie. Hmm. And, and, and he watched the movie and he came out and, and he said, you know, I think you actually, you actually changed my mind about this. I think there might be something to it, you know, and, and it, for him, he needed, the PhDs after the name, you know, he needed uh, somebody like Brian Josephson, who's a Nobel Prize winner for for quantum physics, and and uh, you know, professor at Cambridge for many years. You know, we went to Cambridge and interviewed him because he has, um, you know, talked openly about the existence of psi phenomenon and and studied it, and 
uh, and actually really been maligned for it, you know, in the scientific community, because uh, there's a lot of stigma and bias to this stuff. And, and, and these people who are just brilliant scientists have all experienced it. It made them all kind of gun shy in a way. Yeah. But they all want to talk. Yeah, you're, the capacity for the film to be something you can share with someone who I think has reached wrong conclusions about Psy because they're not in possession with, you know, uh, not in possession of the right kind of information. Uh, we have this game occasionally on the podcast where I ask people, or, or the, like there's a hypothetical barbecue you're at and there is someone there and they do not believe this stuff. And so we have like a short list of books. You mentioned Dean Radin. One of his, um, his latest one, Real Magic, is, is an example of it. But this film goes right on that list of, um, okay, well, let's have this conversation once you've watched that film for that reason. I think, I, I think it's a really really, um, it's a really solid and coherent case and it isn't preaching to the choir. So you have people who may have, have been in other um, films or videos or so on and, and great people and, and fascinating stories. So Hal, of course, and, and, and Russell and, and um, Joe McMonagall and so on have, have spoken about their experiences before. But yeah, you've got much more of the crew involved in it. And, and as you say, hard science um, career um, PhDs. I think it's a, I think it's a really, really... I, I, polemically, I think it's useful. I think it's useful to be able to point to a, a short list of films, particularly for people who don't read, and go, all right, well, go and watch this then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think you're right. And, and you know, I had heard uh, Joe McMonagall talk, and I had heard, um, you know, and, and even after I started making the film, like I, he, he did a great talk to MUFON about, you know, remote viewing extraterrestrial stuff and, uh, you know, being asked to do that and everything. And, and, you know, you hear any one of these people, even Russell, speak, and, and you go, well, that's really interesting. And then you kind of move on, and you, and you kind of go, gee, I wonder if that guy was for real or not. You know, but, but it's not the weight of the entire community. You know, the, 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 the weight of the community and the work that's being done now and the work that's been done. And, and um, you know, because skeptics tend to take this and cherry pick it. You know, they'll look for like one thing, like Uri Geller bends spoons. Oh, he's been debunked. Uh, you know, it's so easy for a magician to fake bending a spoon. Well, can he bend spoons or not? I don't know. I'm not a, um, a an expert that can test that. But did he do scientifically grounded, proven remote viewings in a laboratory setting where um, in a Faraday cage where he was shielded from any kind of signals or uh, anything else where he could have been cheating? Yeah. And, and was he there for six weeks to move on? Yeah. Was there another guy like Pat Price? Or Ingo Swan that that could um, do a pretty darn good drawing of a military site halfway around the planet, uh, you, you know? Yeah, yeah. And and how do you judge that? How do you? This is a skeptic to say about that, other than I just don't believe it. You know, it's like you you. There's not really a way of arguing that because you can't actively fake that unless everybody that's ever been involved is completely on the take. Uh, and and I even thought about that. You know, I thought, hey, maybe maybe this is like a giant plot that the CIA is putting out. You know, but then you go someplace like the International Remote Viewers Association, and you see normal everyday people using psychic abilities uh, to to guess, you know, targets and to look where someone is is currently located in another part of a city, and and they get. You know they're not they're not writing a, a novel about it. Uh, you know they're not they're not giving you know what the guy's having for lunch, but but they're able to give you a pretty good description of the room that he's in, even if they've never done it before. You know, and in fact, sometimes the best results are from people who have never done it before. So, what does that say about us as human beings? You know, you know that that was really the the key point. I wanted to make the film, and and why I stuck with it for you know years making this film, because I felt like there's something wrong with the model. There's something wrong about like the way we look at ourselves in the world and the way that the world actually works, you know, scientifically. We're missing something really key here. And I think that's consciousness. I think that's our own sort of observation. You know, like we're, we're a part of the experiment, all of us, and we're connected in some way that we still don't understand scientifically. So, um, so that was really something that, that drove me. And I, and I think it's very hard to pin down, which is why it's very hard to, come up with a mechanism as to why it works and, and why it's easy to debunk, you know, because you can say, oh, well, you know, I tried it and it didn't work, or we tried it in this other lab and it didn't work. And well, it's because consciousness is fickle. You know, you can't just flip a switch and then something works the same way every time. And that, that's what science likes. 
did speaking of beginner's luck, did uh, did Russell ever try you out when he when he showed up with that box? Did you uh, did you get an early session of him <laughs> uh, seeing how good you are at it? Uh, you know, purposely, I tried not to do remote viewing because I wanted to be just impartial and, uh, you know, just follow this. And it's like it was a rule that actually the scientists at SRI had originally adopted, which was, you know, don't be a part of your own experiment. You know, like, you know, Ken Kress had said that, you know, I, I decided I would never be a remote viewer because I didn't want to drink the Kool-Aid. I wanted to be able to look at this, you know, objectively and facts. And uh, and but, you know, the first probably the first time that Russell and I went out to a meal, you know, we went to this little sushi place near my house and he pulls out his phone and he brings out this iPhone app, you know, ESP trainer, which is an iPhone app that he made uh, to test and to train psychic abilities. You can actually find it on, on um, the uh, iTunes, I'm sorry, the, uh, the Apple iTunes store uh, for your phone. I don't get paid anything for it. It's a completely free app. I'm not trying to sell it, but it's there. And, and basically it's a four choice random number generator and you're going to pick one of four buttons that lo- that are going to light up, um, you know, and which which one is the random number generator going to pick? You're going to pick that number. And he gave this to me. He goes, here, you, you know, you try it. And I mean, I was like a dismal at it. I'm getting like five out of twenty or something, you know. And and um, and he said, you know, the odds of you missing that many are are incredibly. Uh, you know, high. I mean, you, you, he said, you're, you're basically using what's called reverse psi. You know, you're, you're actually like afraid that you're going to get the right results. So you're actually using your psychic ability to uh, get the wrong results again and again and again. And so, yeah, that's, so I, that, I like that term. There's a similar phenomena in magic because however the, these things work, they're obviously working in the same way, just with different words, right? That's really fascinating that you got the, uh, you're like, anti psi <laughs> yeah yeah and 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 you know i'm also and i'm all i know a little bit about the esoteric esoteric sides of this as well i mean i do a lot of reading and i this stuff just fascinates me even just as a creative person and 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 you know it's this this has been called many names throughout time you know the the, the greeks did this the 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 hindus did it you know the buddhists do it i mean you know all of them have names for this kind of stuff 2000 years ago um, Patanjani, you know, um, in the Yoga Sutras wrote, um, you know, you're on the path to enlightenment, you know, you maybe uh, will see and, and, and experience places that are far distant, you know, um, in the past, in the future, you, you may, um, you know, be able to see things that are hidden, uh, you know, but don't worry about that too much. It's just, they're just signposts upon the path to enlightenment and don't, do, don't, don't get too caught up in it because you can get lost. And, and, um, you know, that, that blows my mind. I mean, you know, these, the, Ingo Swan, you know, who was one of their most successful psychics coined the phrase remote viewing, but, um, people have been looking at things at a distance using their minds since the beginning of time. Yeah. And, and it's funny you mentioned Ingo, uh, and we were just talking about Joe McMonagall and doing, and yet their stories of using RV to look at things out in space. Was there a deliberate decision to leave parts of i guess the fort mead story out where they were doing th- there were people remote viewing things on the backside of the moon because that's one of the more interesting for the overlap in this stuff with you know general quote-unquote credible ufology there's a really interesting part of that i mean ingo as is in the film um identified rings around jupiter before uh, we actually could see that they were there but there was more mm-hmm. interesting stuff or not interesting uh the story gets stranger as it gets further away from SRI, but nevertheless appears to have happened. And I noticed that that kind of Fort Meade stuff was uh, under-described. Is that a deliberate decision to try to get the hypothetical person at my barbecue to be convinced of the phenomena? Or were there, did, it, did the discussions well, if, if- not land where you want there? No, no. Um, it, it it was a, it was a deliberate decision, and 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 the deliberate just, and I had read like Penetration, Ingo Swan's book, where he talks about remote viewing the backside of the moon and, and these kinds of things, and um, Russell Targ and and Hal and a lot of these other scientists that were involved whole lives trying to defend the work that they had done, and 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 you know these are not woo woo you know people who who uh, you know. Are 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 saying anything without the credit the the um the data to back something up? They're just looking at data. They're looking at what's there. Now it did change. I think everyone that I interviewed. I mean, everyone that I interviewed, I feel like was probably a more uh 
a more coherent soul, you know, because of the work they had done. Because you can't, when you're looking at the data, you can't help but realize that we're all connected in some fundamental way. And it's the same thing that all of the great masters said, you know, so you, you can't get away from that. But, but in terms of the discussion, um, Russell would say again and again, only one believable, un- only one unbelievable thing at a time. And, and, and that was really about sort of, to me anyway, remote viewing and, and, and this work that was done for the government is sort of like a gateway drug for people, you know, because you, you, if, if this is possible, then like I said, there's, there's something wrong with the model. And then you're, you have to open up the possibility that you might be wrong about other things as well. You know, now the danger of that is that you get lost in fantasy and in, in sort of speculation and, and anything that was remote viewed that we can't really prove um, might be an interesting anecdote, but you can't prove it, you know, um, and, and then therefore, so for someone who's a skeptic, they go, ah, oh, you know, they, they say there's bases on the moon, but we can't prove that. So the whole thing is just BS. And, you know, I don't know, you know, I don't know, but, but um, I can tell you that, that there were many, many things that they did operationally for the government that only the U.S. government could actually prove and did, you know, were, were successful. You know, so, you know, you and I could go look at, uh, you know, Soviet submarines all day and put pins on a map as to where they are, but we can't verify what's there. And, and there's the rub, you know, so, so when it came to something like spoon bending or it came to something like um, ETs, I, there's a ton of stuff and a ton of remote viewers will, will tend to talk about those types of things. Um, but for the film, you know, um, one unbelievable thing at a time, you know, ESP is real. You know, that's plenty. You know, you, you, if you can bite that off and, and, and believe it as a, as a sort of your everyday sort of layman going about their day, then all of a sudden the world becomes a much more connected place and it becomes much more um, sort of a magical place for people, you know, and, and they tend to, they'll look at the, the world a little bit differently and hopefully they'll have a little more understanding for their neighbors, you know, and, and maybe the planet, you know, and, and so that was really the goal. Um, but that said, um, in another project, I might very well, you know, discuss all of that stuff because there is a lot of it out there, and and that is also equally fascinating. You know, um, it very well may be that we have been wasting our time building giant radio telescopes and searching the universe for, uh, you know, radio broadcasts, um, and and there's extraterrestrial races up there just looking at us and going, "What are these?" fools yeah. doing i mean they're they're wasting their time with this we've been talking to them since the very beginning and they just don't understand you know the 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 language we're using which is the language of consciousness you know like wh- why is it that that a uh, a native american um you know medicine man can go out into the, the the forest and knows just the right herbs to pick to create some sort of remedy why is that you know be- because it's in the, it's in consciousness you know and and we have an, a fundamental ability to access that consciousness and and i think that that means anywhere you know even even um when we talk about life after death you know if, if energy cannot be destroyed and and there's a part of your consciousness that that does not reside in your body because you're able to basically use your imagination as an engine to travel wherever it is you want to travel and look around then then what does that say about us when we die you know it, it what it means is that part of us is not living in this current moment it's outside of the moment and that means it's still there so it, it's it's very profound, and and I think to to get in the weeds about you know um, sort of like different stories and things that that we can't prove, then it would have actually made the film more susceptible to be completely discarded. Mm. And and I was always thinking about my skeptical friend who's an atheist, uh, or my my family who who knows nothing about this, or or anybody else, because I wanted something that that could be um di- easily digested and even even so i mean i i mean i've seen people walk out of the film and their worlds are just like rocked and you know joe mcmonagle says something you know you can't in his book mind Trek, he says um you can't take away someone's worldview without giving them a different one you know you you, you have to sort of lead someone you know someplace and and uh you know if you can accept the reality of esp then uh, you know that that really fundamentally changes maybe what you think about the world, and hopefully it'll open up a lot of other questions and start people down a path that you know makes them hopefully better human beings. I mean that would be my hope. Yeah, it was it was my guess as I was watching it that it was a, a deliberate decision to um, 
sort of range bind it to to convince again your your atheist skeptic friend or my hypothetical barbecue guest. Um, and mm-hmm. if you do a series of them, Lance, they can actually be called one unbelievable thing at a time. That would be great. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great idea. Thank you. I like that. Uh, that's a very good idea. You know. Um, but that said, I mean, you know, I did hear stories uh, of, um, for example, you know, Hal Putoff told me a story that, uh, you know, Pat Price was tasked on a, um, a certain part of Alaska for some reason. And, um, and, and, uh, and, and as part of the sort of mental noise that he was getting outside of what he was supposed to be targeting, he'd look up and say, you know, wow, there's, there's like a whole ET thing going on here. There's like a, there's like a, a base here in Alaska in this, in this mountain. And he would start describing it and describe how there were UFOs, you know, constantly flying in and out of it and all this. And, 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 you know, because Pat was such a completely competent remote viewer when he was looking at anything terrestrial, um, you know, Hal, and, and because I think Hal had a interest in the topic anyway, you know, he, he tracked down some government official in that area of Alaska and them and just kind of in general inquired about the area. And he goes, oh, you mean the area where we see all the UFOs all the time? Mm. <laughs> you know, you know, so. Uh, you know, I, I am sure that there's something there, and I think that that. Um, but then again, is it there, really? Like, you know, this this is now we get really esoteric. But but um, if I go climb Mount Hayes, or if I um, go scuba diving in Catalina, where somebody said they saw a UFO go under or something, am I going to find something? I don't think so, because uh, you know, I, I follow that subject matter too, and 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 it seems to me like all of that stuff doesn't exist in the material world that we think of it's not quite as solid as as sort of and dense as we think that you know our material world is so um it, it's incredibly possible that that stuff is operating somehow outside of dimensional space or outside of space and time in some way that we completely don't understand so when and even ingo swan alludes to that in in penetration he is looking at the back side of the moon and and then he becomes aware of a presence looking back at him um you know which is you know, um, enough to kind of shock you. Uh, he says that, you know, like in, in one instance, he looks and it's like, there's nothing there. And in another instance, he looks and it's like, it's all there. It's almost as if it's blinking in and out of reality, you know? So, yeah. Maybe, See, that can be your next to- unbelievable thing, because I think the, the, um, if you want to use the word extra dimensional or imaginal, the next unbelievable thing is that that has some kind of reality. And I don't know how you'd put that together other than, again, have um, credible, credible testimonies. But the one that haunts me out of the sort of remote viewers, um, Ingo's books are fascinating. And, and Russell said before that if Ingo said it happened, it happened. Like he wasn't a liar. He was just, that's, he was just very good at this. Uh, but uh, Ultimate Time Machine, which is another McMonagall book where they um, remote view things that you can never get feedback for, like the crucifixion and the origin of um, mankind on the planet. And the origin of mankind on the planet one is kind of similar to Ingo, where he's remote viewing these sort of short lemurish marsupials on a beach, which funnily enough might be um, like the Indonesian hobbits, right? Who knows? Mm-hmm. But like they noticed him you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> two million years later looking at them and you think that is one of those eerie things that yeah, sh- suggests yeah. that um, at the edges of what we can credibly know about uh, remote viewing, you get the whole rest of a big, weird universe. And, and that's yes. uh, that's really compelling. Yes. Uh, you know, Lynn Buchanan has talked about um, – how your own consciousness can actually send you messages into the past, you know, and oftentimes when you, when you are using your intuitive abilities, you're really just um, talking to your future self, you know, which is very interesting. And, um, you know, I think happens to us all the time. I mean, I think often we will say, gee, where'd that idea come from? Or how did I think of that? You know, and, and, and it's, uh, you know, I think consciousness is, is very, um, a very viral thing. You know, it's something where we're almost like the more, focus is placed on something, the easier it is to see. I mean, it's something that it's a phrase used in the film. You know, the more you try to hide something in psychic space, the easier it is for a psychic to find it. You know, and and I think that um, that's true. Um, and, and I think you can also, but another thing you can do it, that's been demonstrated through remote viewing is you can pollute someone else's remote viewing session. If, if you're sitting there thinking about, um, you know, eating a burger for lunch and the guy's trying to like remote view the backside of the, the, the moon, don't be surprised if the guy comes back saying, I think they're like, I think it's a burger shack on the back of the moon. I don't know, you know, because, because you're dealing with your filtration system and, and, and it's not a, um, 
it's not a stovepiped pipeline. You know, it's like it's an open signal. You know, so so you pick up a ton of noise, and and uh, and I also think that there's something to the fact that when you get a lot of these like seers through history who have made like really dire predictions about things and then people wonder like oh my gosh is the comet going to hit is planet x going to crash into the earth is is uh you know are we all going to die next week because some psychic says so you notice it's never right you know it's just never right and and it seems like the bigger stuff and the more sort of um ungrounded stuff that that uh, a remote viewer looks at uh, the less likely it is that that it's actually right because probabilities when you're looking out into the future and oftentimes even just the act of observing affects it you know like the double split experiment with the two you know with the x-ray you shoot the x-ray through and if a scientist is observing it, it goes through and hits one point in a part as a particle um if he's observing the other slit one point one point in a particle um if everybody walks out of the room then that x-ray just turns into a wave and it just blankets the entire you know background and nobody's there to observe it so i really think that you know, consciousness is is so fundamental, as Max Planck said, and and it's not just fundamental, but it's the it's it's the vote. Like like you, you know, Gordon, get the vote as to whether or not the planet is going to blow up when Nibiru hits or whatever, because you know you're you're observing that prediction, and then you're actually making the decision as to which reality you want to participate in. You know, because I I, I think. Even when remote viewers are are doing gambling experiments, like one of the things we have up on our YouTube page is uh, a uh, a gambling. Uh, you know, I did a mini doc um, following current day remote viewers um, gambling in Vegas, and there's a physicist from SRI named Marty Rosenblatt with the Applied Precognition Project, and they they basically do these gambling experiments, and and um, oftentimes remote viewers will get perfect descriptions of the wrong target because they're using associative remote viewing. So they're, they're going to, you know, they, they basically will say, okay, in 30 minutes, we're going to come out here and show you one photograph. Um, and, and that photograph is going to, you know, represent the winner of the game or whatever. Uh, so, um, so describe what we're going to show you in 30 minutes. And oftentimes, I mean, I've seen it happen. I've actually, I also lost money on a bet because one of the best known remote viewers got a perfect description of the wrong photograph of the losing, you know, the losing bet. And, and, uh, afterwards I called Russell and I said, man, I lost money. Cause you know, Jeffrey Mishlov, you know, he, he got this, this r- perfect description of the target, which was this nuclear submarine. He drew like a, a cylinder with a cross on top and he said it was nuclear and it was a city on the water and, and he got it. But those remote viewers are never even shown that photograph because it's the losing proposition. And, and, um, and Russell says, well, of course, because, you know, Jeffrey is well known for getting perfect descriptions of the wrong target, <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and it's, it's like his consciousness is operating in a different reality that is not the reality that, that we wound up in, you know, so he saw the other outcome of the game. And, and, and so if that's the case, then both things were possible. And, and he just latched on to the wrong one that was never even seen by anyone. You know, so how do we, where do we go from there? Well, so it might, that the both things are possible is, is one analysis. But one of the things that you just kind of mentioned that Russell also talks about in the film is that the more you try to hide something, the the easier it is that it sort of lights up for remote viewers. So, you know, famously discovering uh, NSA bases next to a log cabin, right? So um, right. if right. you, it's, it's almost, and this is, I think a more interesting metaphysical or philosophical question than something that's fairly easy. And even for me, pedestrian or quotidian, the idea that everything is consciousness, um, fine, whatever. Meaning structures reality because Mm -hmm. you, and that like, that is the reasonable conclusion from the fact that bigger or more dramatic events or more intense or more secret things. So how is, how is that embedded in the universe? And I wonder when it comes to gambling um, experiments, whether there isn't something to do with that. And here's one, which was how I would structure another, say, um, silver market experiment would be mm-hmm. to say at the beginning that whatever money we make is going to go to a um, uh, an ocean charity or like a marine reserve or, or, or something so that you don't actually get it. Because I think two things happen there. I think if meaning structures reality, you might – be hitting up against some kind of rules or you are definitely hitting up against something and this might be jeffrey's pro- not problem but this might happen in jeffrey's mm-hmm. head that we grow up with really um 
toxic ideas about abundance and, and money and lack. And, and if you're trying to use your um, consciousness and it has to go through all that accumulated nonsense that just as a human in the 21st century, we, we have, I think that kind of skews the results. Cause I think about this from a magical perspective often, which is how do you, how do you actually optimize towards results? And if it, you can't just kind of be like, I don't know, um, Biff Tanner in, in Back to the Future, you can't just use it to become immensely wealthy and ruin the universe. I, and I don't know why, but that's, that's right. fascinating. Well, um, I mean, we have to get a lot more esoteric when we when we talk about that kind of stuff, and that's great. I love doing that. I, I have my own, you know, personal beliefs and all this stuff. But but it's it's um, it. I think what you just said was very very um, profound and interesting, and and you've definitely studied all this stuff. You you really get all this stuff, and and I think that there is something to be said for uh, just like me how I I chose to get. I was basically using psychic ability to get all the wrong answers on the ESP app wrong. You know, it, it's very similar when you're doing gambling experiments or, or any kind of experiment where you have to repeat the same sort of thing again and again. Um, it's like, uh, you know, your consciousness goes out there and says, you know, um, I, I just don't feel right about the way we're making money doing this or whatever. So I'm just going to always go to the wrong answer. You know, and I'm going to give you great results of, of the wrong answer. So you're you're really psychic, but you're you're psychic in a way that is not productive to where you want to go. Um, but they find again and again that in in when you have like a group of of um, remote viewers trying to look at future events or things like that, um, you can't do it repeatedly over and over and over again because there's like a decline effect um, that that kicks in. And um, as you know, this is not possible, so I'm just going to stop letting it work. Um, if you were really going to have a really successful uh, gambling experiment or playing the stock market or something, you would use people who had never done it before, and you would have them only do it one time, like a group of college kids or something, which statistically they've done and it worked. Um, and and then they would do really well, and then you'd never use them again. You'd get a completely new group of people, and you probably would have a computer have to pick the targets, you know, because the other uh, real danger here is that. Um, you have people who know something about the target. And if anybody knows something about the target, then there's always the danger that you're reading their mind and you're not actually looking at the target. This is a technique that remote viewing teachers actually in incorporate. I mean, Ingo Swan knew the target and Russell would always say, I mean, when, when he was training like the army guys and Russell said, you know, this is, this was a big point of disagreement between them. Cause Russell would say, you know, it's silly that, that you know the target cause they, you don't know if they're actually looking at the target or they're just reading your mind. Now, that alone is an incredible thing. I mean, just as a layperson hearing that, it's like, oh yeah, he was just reading his mind, no big deal. But, but also, um, it contaminates the the uh, experiment. You know, like um, I, I recently, a friend of ours, you know, called us and said, I'm selling our my house in Florida because, um, you know, um, I was part of this big remote viewing experiment and we all came back with the same thing. There's going to be a tsunami on the <laughs> East Coast in December, and I got to sell my house, and I'm like. Don't sell your house. You know, there's not, there's not going to be a giant tsunami. You know, it, it, there's never the giant tsunami. You know, the, the, it, the, the uh, psychics are saying this stuff all the time, and and you have a vote in that. You have a vote in reality. Don't live in that one. If your if your emotions take you down that road, you know, maybe you'll you know get splashed by a giant thing of water or something. But it's not going to be a tsunami that kills millions of people. It's not going to happen. And and um. And it, of course, it didn't happen. You know, it, did, it didn't happen. You know, that was in like 2017 or something. So the the thing is that that where our consciousness sits is 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 important, and and it's the consciousness is so viral that it, it could have been that all of those really good remote viewers, like maybe one of them, had a real fear of water, or yeah, exactly. or uh, had experienced some really bad thing, and all of them were looking at the same identifier as the target, and and uh, you know probably contaminated the the sort of telepathic pool amongst the others you know like if, if i go to a psychic like if you if you sit down with a tarot reader or something and and you already have it in your mind what you want to hear um is that psychic telling you what's really going to happen or is she telling or he telling you what you want to hear you know it, it's like just because somebody has the ability to to do that kind of thing also doesn't necessarily mean that they're fully always honest like you know they they can very easily i mean I, i've had this happen to me i i, I 
saw a psychic once and she said, oh, it's, uh, you know, she told me all these things about myself and then told me about how I was cursed and I had to spend $600 to buy a candle to uncurse myself. And I, and I thought, oh, no, I think I'll pass. And I left, you know, because she had real ability, you know, but that doesn't make it 100% accurate uh, or uh, or even necessarily honest. No. You know, and, and, and so – you know, you, you got to use your discernment on this stuff and, and, um, and sort of, you know, it is on the other hand, very true that when something really big is coming up, like 9-11 or even the Oscars or things like that, there's measurable changes that happen in the earth that, to things like the magnetic fields and, and to random number generators all over the planet. Well, you know, and that kind of strays exactly, away a little bit. Yeah, this is exactly how you solve for the, if, if one psychic says that an asteroid is going to hit the uh, United States next week, what that means is every other psychic is saying no. So, like, mm-hmm. you just play the, you play the balance. If 200 psychics say it, <laughs> start thinking maybe there's something to it. But it, it's funny, well, it, it well, makes the news, like one person says there's going to be a mega tsunami that, you know, um, destroys Taiwan. And, right. and you go, well, that means, is it? Has anyone else said this? And you look okay. So it's like one person, and and but if a hundred of them around the world are like, mm, mm, then then maybe get on a plane. But um, this is, uh, <laughs> or if this they're all is, packing their bags quietly and leaving in the middle of the night, you know exactly. <laughs> exactly. Like, oh, wow, but this is minute. like what I think <laughs> is, um, and it's very much Russell. Uh, his contribution to the kind of like wider practical esoterics is is that match of, of probability and, and how as much as possible to clean the experience. So when in London, when I was testing myself, like I had to have the same problem testing myself, like, you know, playing with remote viewing, I went to Notting Hill Markets and bought a bunch of old photos Like you can buy them for like a couple of pounds, just, you know, old photos and stuck them in envelopes and randomized them. And, and that was the best I could do as like a one person experience. But it's still, I mean, it worked. But the thing is, I still knew um, I just picked up a handful of photos and tried not to look at them, but I still knew some of them. So that was as clean as I could get it. But uh, Russell's one, my favorite is um, when he talks about, um, you know, if you have a, f- like, if you don't have a fear of flying, like he's got this idea of, um, if you have a fear of flying and you uh, dream about a plane crash before you get on a plane, it's probably fine. Um, if you don't, Maybe think about it, you know, and, and that, that kind of thing is, is, uh, is really, really useful for people who are, whatever they're doing, meditating, remote viewing, um, exploring other methods of divination. Um, the remote viewing programs have given us, I think, really useful modern techniques to try to make that as, as clean as possible. And, and that's one of the reasons why Russell is my hero. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that, you know, and, and, and that said, you know, I think we have an inherent intuitive ability you know, be aware of danger and things like that i mean i think that's, that's very well proven and i think it's the reason that you and i are here having this conversation and not someone else because uh, our ancestors knew to go left and not right to avoid that tiger behind the tree you know it, it's it's there's a an inherent sort of knowing that is rooting for you you know you can call it your higher self you can call it your spirit guides you can call it you know god you can call it whatever you want but but your your consciousness wants you to get out of the way when that bus is coming towards you you know and and like for instance um on 9/11 you know statistically there were far less than usual people in the world trade center that day it was like spooky how few people actually were killed. There actually should have been a lot more people killed, but a lot of people just didn't didn't show up to work that day, you know. And and there's tons of stories like that, you know. So it's it's um, you know, I think that you know consciousness is is always sort of there under the surface as a tool that you can access, but but we we question all of that so much that it, it just doesn't um, allow us to get out of our own way. You know, and and uh, I think that's the thing. Like, um, and and another thing that's really interesting, and this is a anecdote from the film that um, that I that I I love. Um, I think that the more something is looked at, it doesn't matter if it's in the future or the past, the easier it is uh, to pick up on. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and and I'll I'll toot my own horn for a minute. I think even the fact that our film exists actually made some of the work at SRI better. This is just my own layman interpretation of it. But but I think that if somebody were to do some psychic experiments and and then put half up on YouTube and, and half not and have millions of people see the stuff on YouTube, that I think that statistically the results would be better every single time the more people, even in the future, are looking at it. You know, do, and, and do you know who Ernesto Di Martino was? 
No. Uh. He's a 20th century anthropologist, um, and he has this contention that cultures that believe in magic get better magical results. And he's Italian, but he, he did a lot of work um, studying Brazil. And what you've just said is basically the Di Martino hypothesis, which I'm completely here for. Um, mm-hmm. If you open up, and this is one of the things the way a film of, like yours is so important for people to see, um, the more people are aware that this is actually real, the better we get at it. And and that is seems to be foundational to the universe. Um, if you look at people like Rupert Sheldrake, who, who observes that really difficult crystals form faster. So if you if you're trying to put together or coalesce a crystal out of a, um, a a chemical solution that hasn't that is either unstable or hasn't been put together before, the first time the crystallization happens is slow, and the next time is a little bit faster, and the next time is a little bit faster. And there's something about doing things for the first time mm-hmm. or opening it up that is kind of like the meaning thing. The universe is yeah. the implications of this are quite eerie, but I, I completely agree with you that um, the more people are aware of these programs um, and and the more, more specifically the more people are aware that humans have this as a natural capacity the better we get at it yeah i think that uh for one thing our film is going to really upset the apple cart in that it's going to really open up a lot of people to the possibilities of this which i think does in a sense affect the collective unconscious mm-hmm. you know um or, or super conscious you know um but i think that what you're getting at and i think what i'm getting at too is that we're, what we're really talking about is the origin of life. You know, I mean, I, I think that, that everything resol- revolves around uh, sort of the conscious focus, you know, that, that we bring to the table, you know, and, and I think that everybody else brings to the table as well, you know, not just us. But, but you see it again and again. It's like the, um, like the 100th monkey effect. I'm sure you know about that. Mm-hmm. You know, like, the, you know, the, you, you, 100 monkeys on an island figure out how to use a particular tool, and then every monkey in the entire spe- species no matter where they're located are are also able to use the tool at that point you know and and you know it's a and they've done uh, repeats of that study uh you know even in england uh, you know there's a particular type of uh, bird that that uh, um figured out that it could fly down and tap the top of a um a milk carton that the you know milkman leaves in front of the the building and and get the cream out and and uh and then once a small population of those birds figured it out, birds all over the island were were figuring it out and, mm-hmm. and able to do it, you know. And and so it's 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 like um, it's like when you're the first person to do something somewhere, it's like you're blazing a trail that then makes it easier for everybody else to follow. So um, you know, and it's and it's a, uh, I think it has to do with coherent. Uh, thought, you know, like you can have a ton and ton of chaos, but like one person who really gets it. Uh, like a like one of the great masters, like a Buddha or somebody, you know. Um, it's it's like those thoughts are much more viral than than all of that chaos around it. You know, it's it's kind of like the way you light one match in a room and you illuminate that whole room, no matter how much shadow is there. You know, so so our consciousness um, is like um, like a, an amplifier. You know, or, or, you know it, th- that signal goes out, and then it, and then whatever you're thinking, uh, especially if it's if it's a conscious, coherent thought. If it's a, if it's not like just complete gibberish, then other people are able to pick up on that. That's why the radio is invented on two different continents within days, or the airplane, or uh, you know, on down the line, all of these innovations. Once somebody figures it out, then um, it just becomes easier. And and you know, Laurie Williams, who who is one of the uh, remote viewers that are contemporary that we interviewed for the film. And she she's a very, very well-respected teacher of remote viewing. She has a company called Intuitive Specialists. Um, and one of the first things she said to me when we were talking about her students, in, in the film, she's the one that's uh, teaching the Russians at the end. She's got this group of Russians in Los Angeles, and she was teaching them. She said, you know, I tend to use the same targets over and over again uh, in these classes because um, once anyone has looked at the target, uh, even if it's a class a year later and another person randomly selects that same target, um, it somehow makes it easier to see. Uh, the same way that even if the same person looks at a target over several days, um, it's like it blazes a trail uh, to the target in consciousness that's making it easier to see because of the repeated focus. You know, and I thought that was fascinating because of what it says um, you know, about sort of the effect of when a lot of attention is placed on something. No, absolutely. Um, absolutely. So, towards the end, I, I, we mentioned before I'm a bit of a nerd for this material and, and a few things. So I'm going to ask you some detailed questions um, 
but a detailed but brief questions about, I guess, the history of the program and new things I learned. So when Russell met Hal in 1972, he said, I think I've got some money for this research, right? That's in the film. Mm-hmm. Where whose money was that? If it was before the CIA meeting that they went to, so where was okay, like, so the hypothetical first money before the CIA? Well, this gives me an opportunity to plug my YouTube channel because um, on the YouTube channel, um, which is uh, Waking Universe TV um, on YouTube, or, or just you can type in my name, Lance Mungia, and it comes right up, um, is something about um, Russell's ESP game. You know, which was that app I was mentioning, um, and and that's actually the, was one of the initiations of of their funding that they had. You know, Hal had done some experiments with Ingo, uh, just sort of out of curiosity because he was interested in in the area. Um, but the first real funding that they got to to have a real program at SRI uh, came because Russell had invented an ESP game. This was in the you know 1971, you know something like that. He invented this big box, which was a random number generator. Does everything that the app does. The same idea. It's like it's four choices, and a, a bell's going to ring, and and something's going to light up when you select the thing that is going to come up next. And um, he took that. He got invited to a conference in spec on speculative um, technologies. Uh, by Werner von Braun, of all people, you know the ex-Nazi, you know rocket scientist who became the uh, one of the directors of NASA, and um, you know he was already well known in laser circles. Both Hal and Russell were very successful uh, pioneers of of the laser, and had worked for the government for many years doing, you know, laser development. And um, so Russell shows up at this conference with his ESP game you know, that he had built kind of just for fun. He had already done some early experiments at Sylvania Laser Labs, uh, you know, with this game. And, um, you know, he had wanted to try to find funding because he already had all these really great government contacts through his laser work. And um, he shows the game to Werner von Braun. And Werner von Braun plays the game and and does really, really well at it. He brings over, you know, Jim Fletcher, who's like the administ- head administrator of NASA, and says, you got to try this. And and they're sitting there, and they're playing with this game. And and there's a whole YouTube um, uh, short that I did on this. It didn't really make its way into the film because it was too long. But um, if you go on my YouTube page, you know, um, there, there's like a probably a 10-minute, you know, um, episode all about this. And and Russell tells the story, and other people talk about it. And, and um Basically, Werner von Braun says, you've got to fund this. And and meanwhile, Edgar Mitchell, who was the Apollo astronaut, uh, was also there. And he tries it and he loves it. And he had already had sort of his own mystical experience in space. You know, like when he was looking back at the Earth from the moon, you know, he had uh, like a very profound sort of enlightenment moment and and uh, called a samadhi moment is what he called it. And um, so they were all very enthusiastic about this. And, and NASA was like 50 grand or something, you know, initially to, um, to basically teach astronauts how to use this game in order to improve their intuitive ability. So if something goes wrong in space, they have some tool within themselves that they can use to try to troubleshoot the problem. And, and, uh, and they trained, I think he said about a hundred people or so at NASA got really great, um, results and, and that, statistically all of the participants were able to improve their scores over time so that was the initial funding that that got them to have any kind of program at SRI and then they brought in Ingo you know they brought in Pat they brought in uh, Pat Price who's another brilliant psychic that's in the movie uh, as subjects and they were doing very typical ESP experiments I mean Gonsfeld experience experiments where it's like you know what's in the envelope uh, you know guess the card trick you know kind of thing and and uh, and Ingo says you know, th- this is stupid. Why are you having me guess the card in the envelope? You want to know what's in the envelope? Just pick it up. You know, like, he, he, why don't you give me something better to look at? You know, because I can see anywhere on the planet. And and so on a break, just to humor Ingo, because he was sort of a very gregarious kind of, uh, you know, well outspoken guy. They started sending the assistant out somewhere, you know, to go hide on a break. And and Ingo started describing where the where he was. And then they figured out that they could actually do the same thing just using coordinates as an identifier, latitude, latitude and longitude. And about that time, um, CIA gets wind of this, you know, because they're already doing this work for NASA. And, and uh, CIA was very, very concerned by what the Russians were doing, you know, because in the Soviet Union, um, there was something like 70 different laboratories scattered all throughout the, the Soviet Union where, um, where, according to the intelligence, they weren't just studying it, they were using it. 
you know they were they were actually using it in a outbound way you know they were they were actually trying to affect things using the mind like you know trying to perturb stop the heartbeat of a goat or you know i don't know whatever and and they didn't think that any of this was actually legitimate they actually thought it was all bogus it was propaganda but they didn't know so when they find out that somebody has a government contract already you know studying psychic abilities well kit green shows up at the doorstep of hal put off and knocks on the door and says you know we've been looking for you um and we want to know if this phenomenon is real we don't think it is but if you can prove it we'll give you some more funding and um and Hal says, well, you know, we've been using, you know, coordinates. And he says, and Kit said, you know, what do you mean you've been using coordinates? You know, and so Russell, Hal, Russell and Hal explain this whole thing. And then Kit goes back to CIA, um, looks around for somebody that knows about coordinates and finds a um, satellite analyst, you know, a sat satellite photographer analyst, you know, who he knows. And he just randomly says, just pick some random coordinates on the planet that, that you know that you can actually verify what's there. And and then give me that, you know. And so the guy did. He gave that to SRI. Both Ingo Swan and Pat Price then remote view what's at the site, and they come back with all of this complicated uh, military equipment and um, you know jeeps and large accordion doors, uh, uh, you know, in a hillside and giant radar dishes that are that are um, just tremendously large. And um, and Pat even comes back with. Um, names of people working at the site and code words and things that just a bunch of stuff like gibberish that that he 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 gets out of this both ingo and and, and um, pat were doing this completely independently so they weren't communicating and uh russell and hal get this and they just send it all back to kit and and then kit opens this up and he sees this like just tremendously detailed report of what these two psychics get and um takes it to his friend his friend says well that's not what i View was just the coordinates of my log cabin in the woods. And Kit goes, Well, oh, that sucks. You know, okay, well, I guess there's nothing to this. So he calls back SRI, and SRI, uh, Russell answers the phone and goes, Well, that's unfortunate because both of our subjects came back with very similar results. So we found that very interesting that they both came up with the same sorts of descriptions. And Kit goes, Well, yeah, that is, you know, kind of odd. So he thinks about it for the week. And then in the weekend, he takes his family on a road trip. He's not too far from this guy's cabin out in Virginia. And uh, as he's driving along the road, he looks out and there's these giant radar dishes, just like, you know, Pat and Ingo had described. It's not, not directly at the side of the cabin, but it's nearby. And so he does a little research to figure out like, you know, what, what's there. I mean, it's all there. The, the, the accordion doors, the, it's a military complex, like, you know, and and uh, you know the following week NSA and FBI and his his superiors at CIA all show up at his office you having the CIA spy on the NSA this is a top secret facility that's run by the NSA and you're not supposed to be looking at it and and so kit's mortified and and he says go go talk to those guys out in California you know and and you know the CIA was tremendously concerned about this because they actually came up with um, Pat Price in particular, one of the psychics, um, actually said that he psychically stuck his head in a filing cabinet and he'd written down all of these names and stuff. And it turns out that he actually correctly wrote down the names of special access program things that were happening at that site that were current. And, and so if you didn't have like an above top secret clearance, you couldn't even see that. So how did he, how did a guy who was a Burbank police commissioner who became a subject in a psychic study for NASA actually pick, figure that out, you know, and, and he did. And, and this sent ripples all the way up to the top at CIA. Yeah. Well, that, that was another new piece. It's going to be my last kind of like detailed nerd question. Um, in the 1972 meeting with Sidney Gottlieb, uh, something I learned in the film was that he suggested to Russell and Hal that they dose the RVs with um, high amounts of LSD. Now, this is after MKUltra allegedly or officially ended, and I thought that was interesting. So did um, do you think it did? This is a hot take, but uh, given that, you know, Gottlieb was involved in it and, and dosing people around the country, he basically sits down with these guys who have psychics and says, I want to load them up with LSD, which they didn't do because it doesn't work with the protocols. But that was interesting to me. 72 is after they officially, you know, a couple of years later said MK Ultra ended and it just seemed like a very Gottlieb moment. 
Well, you know, he he Russell has said that um, Sidney Gottlieb was more like sort of like Professor Emeritus at that time. I mean, you know, he mm. wasn't he wasn't like directing CIA. He was sort of more like just the live-in picture there. You know, he was he was he had a place of great respect within CIA. So so everybody listened to his opinions, um, but. Um, I think he was just talking about the fact that LSD was mind expanding period. And what Russell and Hal already knew was that LSD would, would create a a more like an out of body experience where, where the person's staring at like the wallpaper or, you know, something else, but, but with, with remote viewing or any kind of psychic work like that, you, you don't have to be in this heavily altered state. You don't have to do a several hour meditation and, you know, fast for a week and then do a remote viewing. Joe McMonagall says he does his best remote remote viewing for clients now as he's watching Jeopardy at night, when the commercial comes on, he just kind of leans over and starts sketching on a piece of paper and he does the remote viewing. And then when the show comes back on, he goes back to watching a show. You know, that that's that's remote viewing. Remote viewing requires that you have to be um, very present within your body so that you can record and, and notate the specific things in the images that are unexpected that are coming up in your mind and you write that down. Um, I don't think that, that Gottlieb would have been still using um, the sort of the MK Ultra techniques, because um, they didn't really work. You know, like like the the MK Ultra thing and, and using LSD as a, a way of like sort of almost like a truth serum or or whatever. That that it, it wasn't something that was a road that that he would have continued to go down. And in fact, uh, Ken Crest talked to me at length about Sydney. I have a whole different, a whole bunch of material about Sid Gottlieb actually that that I'll be putting out on the YouTube page oh, cool. uh, eventually. And and um, you know, I we we basically got drunk on glasses of wine, and he just went on and on about about like Sidney Gottlieb and all the stuff that Sidney Gottlieb was doing. But Gottlieb was um, turned out to be a huge embarrassment because when the CIA uh, when this came out that that MK Ultra was had existed and they had dosed people with LSD. Um, it was humiliating for CIA. It was a huge put out, and and that actually affected everything else, including the CIA's involvement with remote viewing. You know, like like um, you know, Ken Kress was one of the people in charge of sort of putting out those fires, and and kind of cleaning it all up. You know, and 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 you can actually attribute sort of some of the skepticism within CIA about remote viewing to the MK Ultra sort of debacle. You know that had happened. You know, and um. And Gottlieb was was very gung ho for sort of the paranormal stuff, um, you know. And you know, we tend to think of government as this monolithic thing. You know, government is this this giant animal that just moves around at the direction of a few people, and they do all this stuff in complete secrecy that we don't know about, and it's all part of some grand plan. Well, that's what I thought kind of when I started the documentary. But by the time I finished, I understood by talking to these sort of people that government is so compartmentalized and the left never knows what the right's doing. And there's so many other motivations in government that have nothing to do with scientific reality um, that um, it's very hard to get anything done, you know, is it's very, and, but, but it's easy to keep things secret because um, they, they intentionally in the intelligence community, you know, keep things all compartmentalized where they don't talk about it, um, uh, you know, between different departments and between different agencies. So there could have been 10 remote viewing programs going on. Ken Kress and Kit Green may not know about it. See um, that. Yeah. I mean, I know Russell said that before um, that he would have no idea if it is still going on in, in his exact words in some basement in the Pentagon somewhere. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and a couple of people in, in the, um, film sort of speculate the same thing. It's like, yeah, the the official end of it may not have been. I've heard um, Hal talk about it possibly being used in the private sector, and so on. It it gets away from um, Hal and Russell and so on are experts in their own experience with it, but you're dealing with things just out in the wild now, aren't you? Like, who, who even knows if it's still going on? Oh, it's 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 going on. It's thriving in in many ways. I mean, I I mean, one of the another thing that'll probably eventually be on the YouTube page is that's not in the film is um, the fact that there's a ton of work being done now. Like, like um, you know, Lori Williams' company, Intuitive Specialist, will, like, you know, douse for oil or things like that. Uri Geller says that he'll that he'll do stuff like that all of the time. Uh, Joe McMonagall works for big corporations doing um, 
future proofing for for product development. You know, he'll look at like trends. You know, he told me that you know several years before the whole ebook thing, he was telling you know a large corporation who had paid him to look. You know, don't invest any more money in paper books. Put it all into um, you know digital platforms because it's it's that's the way it's going to go. You know, so so you can look at all these things and and basically. Any psychic can can do that, but but remote viewing is just basically a reference tool and, and, a, and a way of, of sort of cataloging information and um, and a way of easily accessing that information. It's just one technique, but but uh, you know there's a lot of places that are using remote viewing and they just don't talk about it. You know, there's law firms, there's police departments, there's corporations, there's um, you know, but it's completely completely on the down low, and 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 I would be willing to bet money. That although I've lost in the past, <laughs> uh, that 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 if it is going on, and I think it probably is, then it's it's happening the way it started at SRI. You know, it's happening through trusted contractors that that may not even realize that they're doing classified work. Mm. You know, if if I call somebody and I say, um, you know, I, I'd really like to see um, what might be happening in China a month from now um, at this location. And I'm just going to send you some coordinates. Do you mind checking it out? And you don't know if you're doing something classified or who the client is or, or, or whatever, but you may have been already vetted by, by somebody in government high up um, by them testing you out on several different things. And, 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 you know, maybe somebody's coming highly recommended, but, and they're doing classified work and not realizing it. It's sort of like the black waterization of, um, you know, psychic work. You I know? like and, that term. That's yeah. a good way of thinking about it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, lucky last question. Speaking of things you can use remote viewing for, uh, tell us about the music in the film. Ah, oh, I'm so glad you brought that up. Uh, you know, it's so funny because I was just um, exchanging texts with a friend on the phone and he goes, dude, you got to hit the, the how you did the music in the film harder because that's really cool. It's like I've never even heard of that before. It's so great. Um, well, there, there's a couple by the name of Sam and Nancy Smith, and and um, they're both. Um, you know, Sam is a, uh, a a music instructor at College of Idaho, or, or at least he was at the time that we did the movie. And um, Nancy is is a um, person who has studied a lot of remote viewing techniques, and um, they decided to get together and do some experiments with some of the students that they worked with, where where they would. Um, uh, make music through remote viewing you know well like basically what they and there's a there's a whole extra there's an extra feature that's on itunes uh that talks all about this um you know if you if you go to itunes and buy the film you actually get like eight really great extra features that are basically mini documentaries and one of which is called music from the fringe and that's the name of the group that they made um with several cellists college students um and they basically gave those college students some coordinates and said, you know, please remote view whatever is you see at these coordinates, and um, not necessarily coordinates of a place, but just a number, a series of numbers. And uh, and so they they brought the college students into a room and had them all kind of like relax and do sort of a meditative thing, and um, and then they would write down the impressions that they got and also what they would hear, you know, in in impressions uh, based upon whatever the target was. So the the target. Uh, was a um, dragonfly and a, and a poem that someone had written about a dragonfly. And um, all of the students came back with this uh, song about different, um, you know, kind of like bugs and butterflies and flying things. And, and the music kind of sounded sort of like it was, you know, bugs buzzing in the air. And um, I mean, all of them nailed this. And, and then they took that to a composer and then they arranged that arrange the musical impressions that they had gotten through remote viewing um, into songs. And and they did um, two sessions of this. They did one one year, and then I actually had them do a separate section uh, a couple of years later, you know, to to create more music for the film. And and uh, and they did. And and the music is phenomenal. It's all cello music. And and um it's all remote viewed music, and not just with that one target, but you know, they would give them different targets. And I actually told them, I said, you know, please give them a target based upon this sort of feeling that I want this particular area of the movie to have. I want this to be, you know, sort of like intriguing and dark and noir like. I mean, you know, show them something like that, you know, and then they would come back with this sort of very like noirish kind of you know, feeling cello piece. And, and, uh, they did that repeatedly. I thought it was an amazing use of, of the ability, um, you know, as a creative exercise, you know, um, to, to give these cellists inspiration for a song through, um, you know, some other visual cue or some other sort of target that, that lends itself to the type of music that we were looking 
you know, they in, they did that first, and then I met them, and I thought it was such a wonderful idea, and so they did it again, you know, particularly for the film. And um, I'm so thrilled because it, it actually shows you that this is not something that just a super genius like Ingo Swan or or Pat Price can do in a lab. It, it's just part of us being human. It's part of who we are, you know, and. And then some of the other music in the film, I actually composed. This is not an as exciting of a story, but I actually composed it using an iPhone app that I had, you know, because there were there were gaps and things that I needed to fill in with with, with uh, electronic music, and um, and I actually has have kept this phone that I've had for about three years because there was only one app that does the music the way I wanted it to be, and and uh, uh, you know, so I can't ever get rid of that phone if I ever want to use that because the app doesn't exist anymore. <laughs> Yeah, God, see, I wish I'd done that. No, with a music app, that's that's a separate conversation. I wish I'd done that. There's a, yeah. <laughs> a, an app two phones ago that I really miss, but anyway. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they just take them out of there. They take them away from you. You don't even know. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like CIA. <laughs> well, I li- yeah, exactly. Uh, well, Lance, like, I, I love the film. Congratulations once again, and, uh, and you know, and, and thank you for doing it about one of my heroes, and for people who, and thanks for this fantastic conversation, but for people who now are obviously – Climbing over themselves to to watch the film. Where do they go to find out more about yourself and the film and and so on online? And this will, of course, all be in the show notes as well. Yeah. Um, well, you can find the film anywhere on the planet now. Um, you know, we're we're available um, in pretty much every digital platform that you can purchase something for download. So whether you have a local cable service that that, that uh, has video on demand, it should be there. Uh, if you um, have an Xbox, you know, it's on Xbox. If you have, um, if you want to go to amazon.com, uh, you can, you can do that. Certainly uh, you can go to um, iTunes, um, you know, where we are right now. I think the number six top documentary on iTunes after uh, less than a week uh, being on iTunes, you know, we've, we've beaten probably, 50 other documentaries that were released in February, um, you know, to, to be in that spot. Uh, and then next to us is, is the uh, Oscar winner, you know, free solo. And when we started this, the, the distributor said, you know, Oh, you know, don't expect to be in the top 10, you know, right away because everybody's just buying the Oscar films. And, and actually, you know, we went right to the top. So it was, I'm, I'm stunned by that, but um, you know, you can, if you go buy it on iTunes, you can get a lot of the extras um, you know, that, that come kind of eight different, you know, well cut, well put together, sort of short films, including a twenty minute minute docu- uh, mini documentary on uh, those gamblers in Vegas using remote viewing. I was talking about, um, and then you can also um, just you know basically go to thirdeyespies dot com. You know, and and on there you can find actually DVDs and Blu-rays of the movie now. Um, you know, I just put that up yesterday, and um, it's the only place right now that you can actually get DVDs and 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 Blu-rays. So. You want to go for that, and and also YouTube. If you go to YouTube.com, Waking Universe TV um, is my uh, YouTube channel, or just Google. Or, I'm sorry, YouTube. My name Lance Mangia, and a lot of the same extras that are on iTunes um, in slightly different form are are available on my YouTube channel. Um, and I'm going to be putting up more and more and more material as the weeks go on through YouTube. So if you subscribe there on YouTube, uh, you know, please do. And and please for everybody listening, if you like this film write a review for it. Go on Rotten Tomatoes or go on um, iTunes or Amazon or wherever you buy the film and and just write a review because people don't know about this film um, uh, in a lot of ways yet. And um, to keep the momentum going, it's all word of mouth because we are with a distributor who, you know, we're, we're competing against huge, huge marketing budgets that we don't have, you know, so, so this is all about word of mouth. This is a movement, uh, you, you know, uh, please get on board and, and, and watch the film and hopefully I, you'll enjoy it. Oh, you will. Yeah, that's a second for me. I watch mine on Vimeo. I don't think you, you mentioned that one either. But I, oh, that's I, right. Vimeo yeah. is another one. I because yeah. I yeah. I hate iTunes. No offense. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, it's okay. It's okay. I, 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 you can see a lot of the same extras on the YouTube channel, and you know yeah. I, I haven't released them all yet, but uh, versions of them are are all going to be on YouTube. So you're not missing something completely if you don't want to go on iTunes for the extras. You know, you can see them on YouTube as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, and uh, all uh, of this will be in the show notes. And again, congratulations. Um, this has been such a good chat. Uh, I know the film, uh, congratulations on its success, but I know the success will continue. Um, everyone who's listening to this, if you haven't already seen it, you should. Oh, and and please, um, if you subscribe at thirdeyespies.com, I'm also putting out some of Russell's uh, archival remote viewing data slowly. I'm going to stop, you know, you'll, every now and then you'll get a little email or uh, something about what's going on with the film. And, and uh, there's some really cool stuff that 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 we have, some of which was in the film, some not. And, and that's a great place to see all that raw data. 
Brilliant. All right. Well, thank you once again. And, uh, and yeah, and thanks for your time. Oh, Gordon, it's been a pleasure, man. I love talking about this stuff. And thank you so much for having me, man. Good times. As I mentioned in the show, I'm a bit of a nerd for this material, and uh, yes, the film is an excellent choice to suggest to my hypothetical barbecue guest, but it's also, for listeners to podcasts such as this, the best extant overview of this fascinating and long-running episode of Cold War History. So if you haven't seen it yet, definitely do so. Definitely review it and share it and all that kind of good stuff. As Lance and I mentioned in our conversation, this is the work of re-enchanting the world. And if we want more films like this, we have to see that they do well. Anyway, that's the show for this week. I am aiming to have the Makeup Solo Show out next week, meaning it might be another uh, two-episode Thursday. Uh, Between now and then, uh, please do share, subscribe, do all those things. And you know where to find me at this point, on the Twitters. Until next time.